Yes, you can use APS-C lenses on full frame bodies, just like in my last video where I said you can use full frame lenses on APS-C bodies. Who said that? Me. And this is coming from someone who mixes and matches their full frame and APS-C gear very often for the last seven years. So I can definitely tell you, just because you can, does it mean you should? Well, let's find out. In case you didn't know, you can use APS-C crop lenses on your Sony full frame bodies. If you've mounted one before and notice this giant black void surrounding your image, you have to enable APS-C Super 35 mode in the menu. And what that does is that it effectively crops into the image and out of the black frame. Yeah! Sounds great, right? So now we're gonna talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using APS-C lenses on full frame bodies. We'll start off with price and size advantages first. And later, we'll talk about how you can further save some money by buying used full frame and APS-C gear from KEH Camera, who is the sponsor of today's video. APS-C lenses are generally a lot smaller and more affordable than their full frame counterparts. And while they do not produce the same bokehlicious results, in a handful of situations, it may not matter all that much. And in these next scenarios that I'll be bringing up, they will apply to both photo and video users. Scenario number one, if you're just switching from an A6000 type camera to one of the A7 bodies, you will likely still have your lenses from your APS-C days that you can still use on your full frame camera. And that's the beauty of the Sony E-mount system. It's the same mount between these two types of camera bodies. So you can save a bit of cost there while you build up your full frame lens collection. Scenario number two, Versatility is one of the many reasons why I enjoy mixing and matching my APS-C full frame gear a lot. I pack a lot of full frame primes with me, but they do take up a lot of space. At times, I do want a smaller, flexible zoom lens for the videos that we shoot and the casual photos that we might take. Something like a full frame 24 to 70 G Master might feel a little too big, so we would opt for an APS-C zoom lens like the Zeiss 16 to 70 millimeter F4 or the latest Sigma 18 to 50 F2.8 instead, which both are way smaller, but still has very similar zoom range. Scenario number three. It's a little bit similar to number two, but let's just say you want a mega zoom, but you don't want to pack at 70 to 200 or two to 600 millimeter. You can actually pick up an APS-C 70 to 350 millimeter lens. With the crop factor, you're getting 525 millimeter in distance at max range on this lens. Time out. So every time I make an APS-C video and throw in these number conversions, it confuses a lot of new creators. So allow me to quickly explain. An APS-C sensor is obviously smaller than a full frame sensor. Full frame sensor can be taken as the standard. A 50 millimeter lens designed for full frame used on a full frame camera will give you the exact 50 millimeter field of view. But a 50 millimeter lens, regardless if it was designed for APS-C or for full frame, when used on an APS-C sensor camera, you always need to take the one and a half times crop factor into consideration, which 50 millimeters times 1.5 is 75 millimeter full frame field of view equivalent. That's why when you buy APS-C lenses, you often see that bigger number with the parentheses 35 millimeter equivalent in the description, which basically means what the full frame field of view equivalent is. I know it's confusing. Like why don't they just put in parentheses on the lens itself 75 millimeter, right? But an APS-C 50 millimeter is still technically a 50 millimeter lens. It's just designed to be maximized on a smaller sensor, but it gives off a 75 millimeter full frame field of view equivalent. So same idea here for the APS-C 70 to 350 millimeter lens example that we were talking about. Whether you're using this lens on an APS-C camera or you're activating APS-C Super 35 mode on your full frame camera, you need to take that one and a half times crop factor into consideration, which will effectively make this lens into a 105 to 525 millimeter full frame field of view equivalent lens. Now, hardcore Sony users will say, there's a full frame version, 70 to 300 millimeter for roughly 250 bucks more, and it's not that much bigger, and you get all that sweet, juicy, full frame APS-C benefits that you were talking about, plus a higher edge in quality. But yes, absolutely, you're right. In fact, there are a lot of great options out there, but for now, I'm really just generalizing to keep the video short, but as informative as possible. This is not meant to be an extensive buying guide. We'll save that for a future video. Time in. Now, while the above scenarios sound nice, are there any penalties when using APS-C lenses on full frame bodies? 
The answer is yes, and the answer is no. And we'll break it down for photos first, after this quick message from our sponsor, KEH Camera, who's here today to help you save on some money buying full frame and APS-C gear. Moving on to a full frame camera can be expensive, but it doesn't have to be. I started off my photo and video career by buying all of my camera gear used. My first Sony camera actually was a used Sony a7R II, and I saved 800 bucks on it. It was a good deal for me because it was just released at that time. This is the camera I was looking for. Not only was that the camera that launched my YouTube Probably career to happened. where it is today, oh, wow. but it was the camera that I primarily use with both it's full so frame and APS. PSC lenses. But it can be scary purchasing secondhand equipment. Safety is always a concern, hidden defects can be scary, but don't worry. I actually have guides that help you safely examine and purchase used gear. And one of those tips is actually shopping from a reputable store like KEH. Everything that comes through their way, they properly inspect and test before listing it on their storefront with a handy grading scale that lets you know what the condition the item is in. And if the item no longer has the original box, KEH will pack it in a nice case and plenty of wrappings to keep it safe until it reaches your door. It's also backed by a 180 day warranty in case something does go wrong, or if you're ultimately not happy with it, they have a 21 day return policy. And selling your old gear is just as easy. You can get a virtual quote and set in your item for that same proper inspection. And after that, if you're not happy with the final quote or you just simply change your mind, they will package and ship it back to you for free. Whole process costs you nothing. To learn more or see what's available on the website, check out my link below. Thanks for listening. Now back to the video. All right, let's go ahead and break down the penalties for photos first. Yes, when you are switching from full frame mode to APS-C Super 35 mode on your full frame camera, you will take a hit in megapixels. And depending on which full frame camera you're using, it may or may not affect you too much. Here's a handy little chart for you. Go ahead and pause to read if you need to. As you can see, A7R and A1 users will be able to shoot in APS-C mode without too much of a concern. And that's because these are higher megapixel cameras, hence the R in the name. R stands for resolution. In most cases, 18 megapixels is still plenty enough, but most people will likely have the A7 III. So if they use an APS-C lens for photography, they will go from 24 megapixels down to 10 megapixels. Now, is 10 megapixel a bad thing? Not necessarily. As long as you don't do any heavy cropping or planning to do any intense photoshopping, it should still be plenty enough for social media. And if you shoot raw, you can still push a lot of the color data within the file. Now, personal take. While the A7S III is primarily a video camera for many, including myself, I've still been doing a lot of photography with it, and that only has a 12 megapixel full frame but I am just as happy with my results. Sometimes I get lazy, all right? I just don't wanna clog up my hard drives with the 51 megapixel stuff. <laughs> Are you crying? Okay, serious mode. For those of you who do have the budget, I would say this. Consider the A7R4 or the Sony A1. They're incredibly pricey, but think about this, right? You're essentially buying two camera bodies, an APS-C and full frame camera in one. It's primarily why I love these two cameras so much. During my time in London and Paris at the start of 2022, I was using the Sigma 18-50 f2.8, an APS-C zoom lens on the full-frame Sony A1. However, I get all the benefits of a full-frame camera. Better grip, better in-camera stabilization, dual SD card slots, better LCD resolution, and all of the extra little buttons and knickknacks. And, and, and on the A1 and the A7 IV, I can shoot 4K 60 frames per second in 10-bit 422 with an APS-C lens, whereas currently right now, you cannot do that with any of the APS-C bodies on the market, which is actually the perfect segue to the video breakdown. You see, unlike photos, you don't actually lose resolution in videos when you shoot in APS-C Super 35 mode. It will still be 4K if you selected to shoot in 4K. As I briefly touched on, I love using APS-C zoom lenses on my full frame bodies for videos. I love how small the entire package is, and again, I'm getting very similar zoom range to a full frame 24-70. to And actually, on certain cameras, the quality is 
better if you shoot 4K in Super 35 mode, particularly the A7R series. It's 5K oversampling, meaning it's technically shooting 5K, but the processor brings it down to a 4K resolution. So the video quality appears sharper, cleaner, and less noise compared to if you're shooting in full frame mode. In the case of the a7 III and the a7 IV, they get their oversampling in full frame mode. They're shooting 6K and 7K respectively, but the processor in the camera brings it down to a 4K resolution. So those extra bits of information just makes the overall video image quality sharper. But if you shoot in APS-C mode with those cameras, there's no oversampling, or at least not much with the a7 IV. Just pure 4K. Now, is that a bad thing? No, the a7S III has no oversampling whatsoever. It's just 4K and yet it's the most popular video camera on the market, allegedly. Who said that? Me. So even if your camera shoots pure 4K in Super 35 mode, it will still look just as good. Really? I've shot full frame mode with the a7R series. I've shot APS-C mode on the a7 III. In a practical real world use case scenario, most people won't be able to tell if it's oversample 4K or not oversample 4K. Now in a commercial or film production environment, maybe it's something to keep in mind, but if you're mainly producing internet videos, it will likely be not a big deal. So in conclusion, for those who are doing more videography, using APS-C lenses can be seen as an advantage. They're more affordable and they're much smaller, especially in the case of the a7 IV, which forces you into a crop when you shoot 4K 60p anyway. If you need an ultra wide lens beyond what a full frame 16 millimeter physical lens can give you, you can achieve that with the APS-C lenses, like the newly announced 10 to 20 millimeter f4 and the 11 millimeter f1.8. Those lenses will give you roughly a 15 to 16 and a half millimeter full frame field of view equivalent on the widest end. And you can also check out my other recommended APS-C lenses for the a7 IV 4K 60p in the video linked right above here. On the other hand, most people would see using APS-C lenses for photography as a disadvantage because of that megapixel loss. So if you're strictly doing photography and you're concerned about that, then generally I would say just stick to full frame lenses. Activate that super 35 mode and crop into that like button for me. Thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.